Matt Taylor. Uh, he studies neuroinvasive viruses, uh, which are viruses that affect the nervous system. Uh, he's, I don't even need to be here. He got his undergrad at the University of Washington before going on to um, Stanford to study polio. I don't say polio viruses. Um, and then did a postdoc at Princeton over on the East Coast uh, studying the herpes virus. And he works um, researching primarily uh, spread throughout the nervous system of herpes viruses. Are you guys, is this all polls? Raise your hand, are you guys all polls? Oh, oh yeah, a lot of extra credit. <laughs> <laughs> and you've also got some right. anthropology and some environmental issues. You guys got all here. Right on. Uh, thank you for coming. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun stuff going on. Um, pretend like you're interested, at least. That's, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Thank you, Luke, for that very stunning. This is his first introduction ever. I don't know if you know, yeah. knew that. He's never had the opportunity to introduce a speaker before, and we were hoping he'd fall flat in his face, and he only kind of <laughs> only did. All right, so I'm Matt. Hi. Um, I'm a herpes virologist. I'm proud to say that every day. I'm, one of the things that everybody uh, talks about at, at MSU is, oh, it's that herpes guy. I'm not really sure I like being called that herpes guy, um, but it sticks. So today... I'm going to tell you, start off with a little bit of how I got to where I am today. So it didn't start with the degrees, it started actually well before then, tell you a little bit about the path, and then I'm going to get you into the research, which I hope you're really excited about, which is talking about alpha herpes viruses. These are the neuroinvasive herpes viruses. Uh, the joke, the punchline of various jokes of herpes is actually herpes simplex virus, type 1. That's one of the viruses we study. We also study pseudorabies viruses. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how these viruses move through the nervous system. And then I'm going to tell you a lot about, probably go way too deep into the research about how we've quantified these spread events. And I'm going to show you some really cool movies. And I'm going to tell you the one movie I want you to remember and take away with. And then I'm going to talk about how we've been studying at MSU the mechanisms that regulate this neuronal spread, looking at a process known as superinfection exclusion, and then embarrass Luke again by talking about some of our work that he helped us with, looking at the impact of antiviral responses on superinfection exclusion. And finally, if I haven't already bored everybody, we'll talk about recombination, which I'm really excited about. OK. so. I've been working in a lab for 24 years. I actually realized I, after I sent this off to Stella that I was wrong. My, my anniversary date when I started was July 5th of 1995. I was right out of high school. And my first lab position, I was working as a pre-undergrad. I was a post-high school pre-undergraduate researcher in uh, one of the major genome sequencing groups. This is before the human genome was sequenced. This is one of the groups that was actually doing the sequencing to get to the Human Genome Project in the Department of Molecular Biotechnology. I was there for about two years um, until I moved into the chemistry department because my boss decided he wanted to do nothing but program. And while that was very interesting and fun and very, very powerful, if anybody has programming skills and an interest in biology, I highly recommend it. It's a very lucrative career. It wasn't for me, though. I like wet lab biology because I'm dumb. And so I went into the chemistry department where I started doing genetic dissection of antibiotic biosynthesis. Most antibiotics are actually made by bacteria. And this group was looking at the genes that are responsible for actually creating these large antibiotics, and specifically the antibiotic rifampicin. That was great, but it didn't pay very well. Um, I got a lot of credit, though. Everybody, anybody do research for credit? Yeah, isn't it fun when you pay for the opportunity to do work? Um, so I decided that after two years of, or a year and a half of working in that lab, I needed to actually get a real job. So I started an internship at a biotechnology company called ICOS. Uh, and while I was there, I was working on a compound known as platelet activating factor acetylhydrolase. It's a mouthful, doesn't really sell very well, never actually went to market. ICOS <coughs> went on to actually find the next Viagra. Anybody see those weird Cialis commercials with the two bathtubs, right? That's what they found. And they made a boatload of money before they got bought out. Um, in between, I became very jaded about uh, uh, industrial biotechnology just because suddenly saving people wasn't as important as giving uh, older guys erections. And so I went back to a more academic level position where I started a, a technician position at the Fred Hutch. At this point, it's already been 
five years of lab work and I've learned a lot in a lot of techniques, but I haven't done anything I was passionate about. It wasn't until I uh, left that position and started in graduate school in 2001 that I finally got to start pursuing my passion, which was viruses. This is a great picture um, of my first summer research project. My boss was a hippie. He was actually uh, uh, really into the Grateful Dead. And the third week I was there was the week that Jerry Garcia died, and he could not be talked to for a week. I was actually told that Todd is just, Todd's in a different place right now. That's okay. Todd was a great mentor, though. He's one of the first of many mentors that uh, taught me how to do science. And uh, through that process, I've, I've sort of tried to emulate their great mentorship skills in my own training. Luke can probably uh, protest that as much as he wants. Um, but the thing is, I want to also stress is that, so I did a lot of those, those, those research programs before I finally started on virus research. The thing was is that all that research was much more important than my education. My education is these degrees, right? Um, so my undergrad degree, my graduate degree, and this is a special diploma that my postdoctoral mentor makes for everybody who goes through his laboratory. But really, it was when I embarked on these different degrees, it was to define, uh, to, to learn a set of skills that would allow me to move on to the next set. So as I was getting my undergraduate degree, I was building the skills, the techniques, and the experience necessary to excel in graduate school. When I was in graduate school, I was beginning to learn the skills and techniques that would have me excel as a postdoc. And as a postdoc, I was learning the, in those techniques necessary to excel as a faculty member. That last part remains to be seen. I'm going up for 10 years this year, so we'll see. The biggest mistake that I see uh, you know, throughout my career is that people think the degree is the goal. The degree is a means, not an end. The other thing you have to do is you have to figure out what gets you excited, what gets you interested, what makes you happy. And the best way to do that, this is a picture of, of, of one of my uh, areas of my bookshelf. These are just the books I read as an undergraduate that got me really excited about viruses. That got me excited about how viruses influence disease and how they influence society. And it was by reading these books and talking to my mentors and my peers <laughs> and my teachers that I realized where I wanted to go with my research. Because really at the end of the day, you have to do something that makes you happy. You have to do something that you wake up in the morning and you can't wait to get into work. Right? If you're waking up and you're like, oh my god, I gotta go into the office again and I gotta pipette another gel it's not going to survive for very long. So you've got to find those things that make you happy. That's not just true in science, that's true in life, but this is about science. So let's talk about science. What we think about in the lab is the processes that have viruses spread. And this is just a movie we took. This is what we call a plaque. At the center is an initial virus focus of infection. There was one virus that infected the cell. That cell then produced more virus and then it spread. And what you're seeing is the growth morphological changes, what we call cytopathic effect. At a certain point, this entire layer of cells will be completely dead, detached, and float away. We can actually use this to quantify viruses, but what we really think about is what are the processes that transmit that virus from cell to cell? And so another way to think about that is it's all infections start with a single, a single virion, a single viral particle. That is the infectious unit that's transmitted from cell to cell that initiates infection in that cell. It will replicate in that cell and it'll produce more virions which will then transmit to the surrounding cells. And so that's exactly what you just saw on that microscopy movie is the process of cell to cell spread. The problem is, is that that kind of breaks down when you start looking at a larger organism like a human being. If a virus can only spread from cell to cell, it's not going to make it very far. And we all know examples of viral diseases that are much more systemic. One great example that's in the news these days is measles, right? A little bit of measles in your lung and all of a sudden, if you're not vaccinated, you're going to be covered in a rash. And how does it get around the body? How does it disseminate from the lung in that initial site, amplify and cause systemic disease? And the way they do that is they can spread through the different systems of your body. One of the key ways that everybody thinks about it is how viruses spread within the blood or the lymphatic system. And we call this viremia, um, but we also can spread viruses through the second most disseminated system, which is the nervous system, where you get spread of the virus within the neurons of the sensory system, and they can then spread in the central nervous system and cause serious disease. Viruses that spread in the nervous system are known as neuroinvasive viruses. 
These have the capacity to infect and spread into the central nervous system, and you can have severe disease, so encephalitis, meningitis, and invariably without the, in the absence of treatment, these are very lethal infections. So some of the key questions that have motivated my career are how viruses utilize the nervous system to disseminate through the host, how virions are transmitted between neurons, and what are the factors that influence that spread of infection. And so during my postdoctoral career, we spent a lot of time looking at that, and the model organism we use for as a neuroinvasive pathogen are those alpha herpes viruses. So everybody, not everybody's familiar with, but you've probably all heard about herpes simplex virus. Only half of you have it. So you know, there's that. Uh, we also study a lot of animal alpha herpes viruses. So the favorite organism in our lab is pseudorabies virus. This is a, a this essentially the herpes, herpes simplex viruses of pigs. Uh, the greatest thing is you can give it to undergraduates like Luke and not worry about him taking herpes viruses home with him because it doesn't infect people. But these are also very important, especially for Montana. Uh, bovine herpes viruses and equine herpes viruses are serious agricultural pathogens. Pseudorabies virus itself is a serious pathogen. It has been eradicated in the United States. So, but ec bovine and equine herpes viruses are still causing severe disease. They can cause, uh, in, 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 in cattle, they can cause premature abortions, neurological disease. In horses, they can cause, uh, invade the central nervous system and cause equine paralysis, which obviously is very bad uh, for horses. So the way they live their life cycle is by beginning on transmission. So it's Easter weekend, so probably nobody's going to go out and get herpes this weekend, but let's say you do, you get exposed to herpes, that is going to initiate on a peripheral mucosal site, depending upon what sort of mucosal surfaces make contact with infected tissue. In this case, Mr. Skullhead got it on the face, and the virus will begin replicating in the epithelium, but it rapidly invades the sensory axons and establishes a form of infection known as latency. This is actually key for herpes viruses is this latent phase where there's the absolute absence of detectable viral products. The viral genome is maintained in these neuronal cell bodies, in those ganglia, but they're not actively replicating. So you have a very long prodromal phase. Now let's say that Skullhead goes out and gets stressed. He goes into a hot tub. Gets, uh, goes out in the sun, it's a nice sunny day, he got a lot of UV exposure, or he's got finals coming up and he's stressed out. This all modifies your state, your physiological state, and it promotes the reactivation of that virus. The virus will reactivate, it will replicate, and then it transmits new virions back down those sensory axons, reseeding infection at or near the same site as the primary infection. <coughs> so for those that suffer from frequent or infrequent cold sore occurrences, you can thank this process of both exposure, latency, and reactivation for that reseeding. You're not becoming infected with the new herpes viruses. You keep that herpes virus with you for the rest of your life. We're a bunch of weirdos in herpes virology. We like to make weird jokes. We like to say that love is fleeting, but herpes is forever. And that's because it's maintained there in those latent ganglia. What we study is primarily that process of neural spread. And so, for example, you take that neuron. That neuron is uh, uh, defined by two structures, the cell body with a dendritic arbor, as well as an axon. That axon is that primary means of sensory information between the periphery and the ganglia itself. If that neuron is infected, it can spread in either a backwards fashion or a forwards fashion. And so if it moves backwards from that dendrite up the uh, neuronal circuitry, oftentimes into the central nervous system. This is what we term neuroinvasive spread, or retro, retrograde spread, which is the property that allows neuroinvasion and causing that severe disease. That reactivation event is what we term enterograde spread. The virus is moving out that axon, out to mucosal epithelia, reseeding infection and initiating those cold sores. So in terms of severity, retrograde spread is much more serious. Enterograde spread leads to that mild disease, but in What's happening is, is that that anterograde spread event is actually very, very complicated, and that's a, a lot of what we study. So in terms of what the virion looks like, herpes viruses are very, very cool. They're on the larger side in terms of the virus structure. The virion itself is rather complex. It's defined by an icosahedral capsid, which in, 
which contains the double-stranded DNA genome. This is surrounded by two layers of viral proteins. One's known as a tegment. It's sort of in a weird amorphous layer. And then it's uh, surrounded by a lipid envelope studded with viral glycoproteins. This is a uh, schematic I drew. Spent a lot of time on it to get that nice symmetry. This is what they look like under electron microscopy. So, and these structures are range between about 150 to 250 microns or uh, nanometers in diameter. It is still smaller than you can see through a light microscope. So the only way to resolve these structures is with an electron microscope. As I said, it has a very large double-stranded DNA genome. It's about 150 KB. Uh, it's about the third largest uh, human virus out there. But you can do cool things with such a large virus that we uh, take advantage of. We can create fusions. So we can take a fluorescent protein. Who here knows what a fluorescent protein is? Cool. OK, so fluorescent pro OK, who here knows what a protein is? Thank God. OK, so fluorescent proteins are proteins with special properties. They transform light. And essentially, they make colored light. And so we can have red fluorescent protein. You shine green light on it. It transforms that light and shifts it towards the red end of the spectrum. You can then see nice bright red things where this protein localizes. Similarly, oh, and what happens here is in this fusion, you get nice bright red capsids, and you'll see those in a second. We can also add transgenes into this. We can add a yellow fluorescent protein. So now this one has properties where it takes green light and shifts it uh, more red into the, uh, to a yellow distribution. Uh, and so now we can use these double fusions to track infection. So much like that uh, movie, I'm going to have to close the shades. Uh, if you go to sleep, I won't hold it against you. There we go. All right. Uh, much like that plaque spreading movie I showed you before, this is the same idea. We took a virus, that virus I just told you about, with the, the YFP, oh, okay, uh, with the YFP, and that YFP anchors into the plasma membrane. That red capsid localizes strongly to the nucleus, but if you look really close, you might be able to see individual punctate structures moving. And what we did is we took a movie of this virus as it began to replicate, and then as it spread from cell to cell. And you can see that you have these long processes that were completely invisible earlier, but you can now detect with those yellow fluorescent proteins. So we can use directly labeled virus to, uh, to track the transmission of, uh, of, of infection from cell to cell as it spreads and propagates. We do this in neuronal culture systems. My favorite culture system to work with is a rodent superior cervical ganglia. This is obviously a rodent head. I hope you could tell that from this beautiful drawing. Basically, the SCG, if you want to think about it for where it's localized on you, is just underneath your jaw, sort of right next to your esophagus. It's wrapped around the carotid artery, and it's uh, paired up with its parasympathetic partner, the nodose ganglia. But this is our neuronal ganglia itself, the superior cervical ganglia. When you break that up, you can get dissociated cultures, where you have individual cell bodies, and they send out long exonal processes. The SCG itself normally innervates a number of organs within your thoracic cavity, so it innervates the heart, uh, the vagus nerve, the spleen, a couple of area, other areas in, in the th thorax. And it does so because it has a very robust growth cone. So this structure right there is the end of another neuron's axon. And what it's doing is it's looking for a partner. It's trying to find a synapse. And so it's gone out, and now it's found this guy right here. This movie was taken about two hours after we plated the, the neurons. So these are very robust neuronal cultures. And the robust growth cone is what we take advantage to uh, grow what's known as a compartmentalized or a chambered neuronal culture system, where we actually can separate the neural cell bodies from its axon termini. I'll tell you a lot more about that, because I have done way too many of those movies. Now, if I take that double-labeled virus, that one that expresses YFP in the membrane and red capsid, and I throw it into those neurons, I can get a movie like this. This is an axon. Each one of those red spots there is one viral capsid. That viral capsid is undergoing long distance and pterograde directed transport. At the end, it's going to spread out of that axon and infect an epithelial cell. And so for about two years into my postdoc, I took lots and lots of these movies. And I came to the realization, one, these are kind of fun. You can actually see this with your, your eye. This is only tenfold sped up. Um, when you actually get these on the microscope, you can see them move from point A to point B, just you know, with your own eyes, kind of crazy. But I also realized that my boss was never going to give up his main projects, and I needed to find something else. And I started asking a simple, very simple question, which was, why do so many virions go down that axon? Or to phrase it better, 
how many of those virions actually move out of that axon and propagate infection into the next cell? Is it one? Is it many? And as it turns out, the field had a bunch of uh, hypotheses, but no real good ideas. So going back to our model, the central question to reframe it is, how many of those virions initiate infection? Pollen reactivation is going to transport down. It's going to reseed infection. Is it one virion or is it many virions? And there's really, at the time, no good ways to quantify it. But we had a great system to model that enterograde spread, which was our chambered culture. Now, you may think this is fancy. No, it's not. This is a piece of Teflon. I buy them for $30 a piece. So you want a lucrative business? Make Teflon rings and sell it to scientists that are chumps. Anyways, we take these Teflon rings and we adhere them to this, the culture surface with some vacuum grease. We set some grooves into there to guide the axons to move underneath the two middle barriers. And what you get at the end of the day is clusters of neural cell bodies on the left side and fields of isolated axons on the right side. Now, the distance there is five millimeters. That's the minimum distance from the nearest cell body to the nearest axon terminus. That distance in terms of virion equivalencies is about 33,000 virion diameters, which would be the equivalent of me, a six foot tall guy walking 42 miles. And I will tell you that our herpes viruses will infect, replicate, and transmit the equivalency of 42 miles all in the time of 16 hours. These guys get in there and they just cook down those axons. It's, a, it's an incredible process to watch. All right, so going back to that chamber, one of the things that we can do with these is uh, differentially infect them. We can infect one side or the other. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to lay down a layer of epithelial cells on the right-hand side. We're going to infect with a virus that will directly infect those neuronal cell bodies, undergo that amplification process. They're then going to transmit within those axons and then uh, spread into those naive cells and amplify in that far compartment. So this is the process we're going to quantify. How I did that was through two model systems. The first was a mixed infection using fluorescent protein expressing viruses. I'll tell you about it, but it's basically the coolest images I've ever made. It's the borderline <laughs> art. The second thing that we did to quantify that, that transmission event was to take that directly labeled virion and track it as it's moved down the axon and accumulated in those cells that become infected. All right, so the first system is all based upon fluorescent proteins. So we have three proteins. As I said, each one is a color. So we have a blue or cyan fluorescent protein, a yellow fluorescent protein, and a red fluorescent protein. Each one is expressed by its own virus. So we have basically three viruses. These viruses are as near equivalent as we can make three independent viruses. When we throw those mixtures onto cells, you end up with this kind of beautiful stained glass motif. Each of these fluorescent proteins accumulates in a nucleus. The color of that cell indicates which viruses infected and are replicating in that cell. We can actually use the distribution of co-expression to quantify or calculate the average number of viral genomes that are expressed in that population of cells. So now we have a way that we can track the extent of co-infection and figure out how many viruses are initiating infection. My uh, colleague has actually used this system to find out that cells inherently can only carry a maximum number of 10 individual herpes viruses at any one time so that there's some sort of limitation on the cell's carrying capacity. Well, we applied that to our neuronal system. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Uh, we applied that to our neuronal system to, to quantify co-infection during spread. So if we directly infect those neurons, we can get images like this, where we get a lot of white cells. White means that all three colors are expressed at a very high level, which is uh, indicative of a high rate of co-infection. In the data that I just skipped over, it basically showed that that co-infection rate that we see in neurons is the same as we see in epithelial cells. So maximally, we get about 10 viruses <coughs> per cell. When we looked at those detector cells in that far compartment, we ended up with images like this, where not only is it a Rorschach test, you can see what you want to see based on your psychology, but we see these sectors of relatively pure color. Very few areas were actually co-expressing two fluorescent proteins, which would be indicative of two viruses that were replicating in that layer of cells. Now, the thing is, is that this is the end product of lots and lots of not only initial infection, but spread. And as you probably have guessed, I like to take a lot of movies on the microscope. And uh, we could now track the progression and development of fluorescence in that layer of epithelial cells. In the top panel is uh, herpes viruses, so <coughs> herpes simplex virus type 1. So we're looking at the spread of simplex 
uh, in axons that you can't see into cells, and you're looking at the development of fluorescence in the cells that are infected from enterograde spread or from those axons. In the bottom panel is pseudorabies virus. And the reason why I use pseudorabies virus not only is because it's awesome, but it's also much faster. PRV starts spreading, uh, we get our first initial spread events at about seven hours post neuronal infection. Herpes simplex virus, we get our first spread events about 16 to 18 hours post neuronal infection. So herpes simplex viruses have a much reduced transport efficiency as well as a spread, whereas PRV has much stronger spread. If we look at the earliest phases of those movies, we get these individual cells. Each one of these cells are, is an infection that's initiated from those axons. And we can look at that and we can quantify the color and say, okay, well, how many one, two, or three color cells are there? And again, we can now use that distribution of color to calculate the number of genomes that are, uh, re uh, that are uh, replicating in those cells. As you can see, most of the cells only have a single fluorescent protein for both HSV or for PRV. And it works out to be about one and a half genomes. So very few genomes are actively replicating in cells after axonal spread. This is an interesting idea, but I say that I didn't get the job at MSU for coming up with one really cool assay. I came up with two. And the reason why is because now, just because there's a limitation on the diversity of genomes replicating, doesn't mean that we've solved whether it's one virus or multiple. It very well could be that multiple viruses happen to express the same color. We don't know for sure. The way we could figure this out, though, was to track the individual capses as they trafficked into those cells. And so here we modified our chamber to add a sporadic number of cells. We used that red capsid virus to track the spread of infection. And we could see, uh, you can't really see it here, but these are the cells that will progress along to infection. So we take a movie, and then we just rewind the movie and count the number of viruses that were there to uh, initiate that infection. So as I said, there's one movie I want you to remember forever, and it's this movie. This is the best movie I've ever taken in my life. I've, I, I'm constantly trying to find a better one, and I can't do it yet. So what you're going to see is we have an axon that's in close opposition to these cells. These are immortalized cells that will receive infection. The cell you want to focus on is this guy in the middle, which is targeted right here. That's Bob. Bob's about to get herpes. Okay, so we have that trafficking event. You see those capsules moving down those axons. We're going to have a little uh, uh, shunt line right there. Now Bob's got herpes. That individual capsid is now docked with its nuclear pore, and it's going to progress along that cycle of infection. It's going to express more of that red fluorescent protein. Those virions will then assemble and go on, and Bob will spread herpes to all of his friends. Okay? And the reason why... Sorry? Bob, Bob is happy till he gets herpes. Right, as most people are, you know. He's a happy-go-lucky cell, and then he gets herpes, and then all of a sudden he's a frowny face. Um, you have now seen infection in real time. Not in real time. Obviously, this is a time-lapse movie. We've compressed it over here. But very few people can say, I saw the moment a cell was infected by a virus. So the incredible thing here is there's only one. There's a single capsid that mediated that infection. So we counted a lot of Bob events. We counted 157 events in total and found that the majority, almost 50% of those, were defined by a single detectable capsid associated with that cell. Very few cells would actually be infected with multiple viruses. And so this correlated very well with our ongoing uh, uh, model, which is that very few virions transmit out of that axon to propagate infection. But why is that? Why do so many virions traffic down to only have one initiate that infection? And what is the mechanism that underlines that? And is this even relevant to a human or to any animal system? Is this what happens in an animal model or not? So we took that, that three-color co-infection model, and we applied it to an in vivo mouse model. Um, is anybody squeamish about animal models? Thank God. So this is terrible worse than that because this is an eye model. We take a needle and we inject it into the eye. Anybody squeamish now? No? Okay, you guys are strong folk. I appreciate that. Okay, so we take that three color inoculum and we're going to inject it into a mouse eye. It's not easy. And it's going to infect a number of cells in that eye. So the first layer of cells it's going to infect are neurons known as retinal ganglia cells. These are the neurons that project through the optic nerve directly into the brain. And so these cells are going to initiate what we call our interrogate-directed spread into the brain. Meanwhile, another set of cells in the ciliary body, these are part of the cells that control your eye movement. 
they will be infected and spread virus in a retrograde fashion through that ocular motor nerve into different sites of the brain. So now we can look at the eye and a couple of different regions of the brain to quantify initial co-infection and subsequent spread, much like we did with the chamber. And so, and those primary sites of infection, so in the retinal ganglia cell layer, it's kind of a busy slide, but hopefully what you see is a lot of white cells or uh, mixed color cells. We quantified this at 12 to 48 hours post that initial inoculation and found that the majority of cells were expressing three fluorescent proteins, indicative of high rates of co-infection. Similarly, in the ciliary body, which is a, a structure on that edge of the eye, we also see high rates of co-infection. It's slightly reduced compared to our retinal ganglia cells. So uh, we get about four and a half to six uh, viral genomes in those RGC neurons. And here we get about three to four uh, viral genomes on average over that time course. Either way, I thought that was pretty good. We're putting a needle injecting two microliters of a virus into the eye, and we're getting co-infection. That was cool. When we looked at the brain, things got very interesting. So if we looked at those sites of interrograde spread, so one of them is the visual center, the visual processing center of the brain called the superior colliculus. I know there's a lot of neuroanatomists in the crowd, so you know, you can hold me, you can talk to me later. Anyways, when we look at those areas of the brain, we look at the fluorescent protein distribution, we found that the majority were only expressing a single fluorescent protein. So again, this is that model of interrograde spread and we're seeing a very strong restriction on this number of viral genomes that spread through that system. In contrast now, we have that retrograde spread, which is the opposite direction. It's moving from a cell body into an axon. And we see at those sites in the brain, higher rates of co-infection. We actually, they mirror what we see in our primary site of infection. So whereas in terrograde spread, we see that drop from about four and a half down to about one and a quarter genomes. In retrograde spread, we see a maintenance of about three viral genomes on average in that population of cells. So what we're seeing here is that not only is our spread, our restriction on pterograde spread relevant to an in vivo model of spread, but also it's unique in that in the opposite direction, we're seeing higher rates of co-infection. And so that when you get into the brain, you end up with two populations, populations with low levels of co-infection and populations with high levels of co-infection. Hold that in your head because it's going to really matter for recombination. Cool. I'm talking way too fast. Um, at this point, we now know that interrograde spread has a strong limitation on the number of virions that propagate from cell to cell. We, from our chamber, we saw limitations on that tricolor, lots of single colored cells. We saw very few virions spreading out of those axons into those cells. And in an in vivo model of co-infection, we saw similarly that same restriction. So I really think we're on to good biology to understand herpes virus infections. We just don't know how this process is regulated. And to start uh, looking at how, we looked at some more of our data from our Bob movies. This is literally what I did because I didn't have a functional lab for about six months after I started at MSU. We tried a lot of different things. We kept very busy, but we didn't have any data. And so I did what every good scientist does, which is mine old data. And in mining that old data, instead of looking at the number of capsids, I started to ask a separate question, which was, well, what's the time difference between capsid acquisition for those cells that are multiply infected? And so looking at a subclass of Bob movies where you had a cell with two or more capsids associated with it, with it I could then look at the movie and ask, well, what's the time difference between the first and the last capsid that infects that cell? And in this case, this distribution suggested that there's some clustering of, or a, a limitation to the timing of co-infection. That really co-infection has to occur within the first two hours, and that there's very infrequently do you see capsids that are acquired at later times. And so we began to ask simple questions, which is, well, when do cells become refractory to infection? And you would think that this is a very simple question that should have been answered a long time ago. Trust me, I've looked at almost every piece of literature related to this. And while this was a known fact, nobody understood what was going on. So we went back to our fluorescent protein viruses. We now have just two, a blue virus and a yellow virus. And if we throw them on simultaneously, you will see simultaneous onset of expression. And when we throw it on with a sufficient number of viruses, all cells will be co-expressing. But if we change up the principles of this co-infection, start with the blue virus, and then wait and add that yellow virus at later times, we can then ask, well, when do cells no longer support YFP expression? 
This was actually my first undergrad's project, and I will tell you freely, the first time she did this experiment, I t literally said, that's wrong, do it again, and do it right this time. I'm a very supportive mentor. All right, so she comes in and she says, okay, well, when we do co-infection, we get lots of co-infected cells. And so I'm just showing you the black and white images. You get a lot of yellow, or a lot of blue, a lot of yellow. Stop, stop, there we go. Okay, a lot of, lot of yellow, and it, it looks kind of teal or aquamarine. If we wait one hour after the removal of that first inoculum, we still get lots of YAP expression. Our blue gets a little bit stronger, so it's a little bit more equivalent. If we wait one more hour, we get this massive drop in YFP expressing cells, not only in terms of their overall expression, but the actual number of cells that are YFP positive. If we wait one more hour, it's completely shut out. We can quantify this through flow cytometry. Anybody heard of a flow cytometer before? Okay, so a flow cytometer is a fancy device that looks at a whole bunch of cells and says how much fluorescence is there. These distributions are looking at the intensity of the fluorescence associated with that cell as a function of the percentage of the population of cells. So, wow, okay, come on, there we go. So what we have here is a gray bar, which are uninfected cells, and now we're just looking at YFP under conditions of co-infection, and all of our cells are expressing YFP. So that same drop I was telling you there correlates with a drop in the population of cells. So we go from 100% YFP positive to now 18% uh, expressing a detectable amount of YFP by this flow cytometer. So, as it turns out, this was the first study to really quantify this effect, this phenomenon. But we didn't know what the mechanism was. But everybody says, oh, those things that limit co-infection are all based on a principle of superinfection exclusion. We all know that herpes viruses exclude themselves through a process based on the expression of a viral protein known as GD. So GD is the receptor binding protein. This is how the virus gets into the cell. It binds its receptor and it initiates infection. And uh, when you express GD in cells, they actually create cells that are now resistant to infection because that GD that's expressed on the cell surface binds the receptor, prevents other viruses from getting in. And so for almost two decades, the dogma of the field was GD expression is the mechanism of superinfection exclusion. And so we got some viruses uh, from a colleague who made GD null viruses. And so this is a Western blot that shows expression of GD by the wild type virus and the lack of GD expression in these two mutants. Uh, this is also, this is a capsid associated protein just to show that we do in fact have viral infection. We just don't have any expression of that glycoprotein D. When we applied it to our super infection exclusion assay. So in this case, the primary inoculum is either a dark wild type virus or a GD null uh, virus. And then we challenge it with a wild type or with a yellow expressing virus. When we apply those viruses together, you get lots of yellow. When you apply that yellow virus at two hours later, you get that exclusion I just told you about. And you still get that exclusion when you do not express GD. And I will tell you, as a young professor, when you are trying to overturn dogma, it is the most nerve wracking, painstaking experience of your life. And you do nothing but doubt yourself on a daily, monthly, weekly, whatever basis until you finally get it published and everybody goes, oh yeah, we knew that for years. We just didn't know it was GD independent. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> so we did. So what are you gonna do about it, right? And so that's what we've been trying to figure out. So, so we, knew it was G we knew what it wasn't. We need to figure out what it was. And so I did what I always do when I have problems. I turned to drugs because drugs are the solution to all life's problems. I wasn't a very good student in, during D.A.R.E. in elementary school. Uh, but in this case, the drugs we're talking about are drugs that modify the course of infection. So you might say to yourself, but UV irradiation is not really a drug. And I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll give you that. But UV irradiation is our best way to inactivate virus itself. And so what we can do is we can apply UV irradiation to our primary CFE virus. It kills that virus. But it asks the question, are we looking at a physical effect? Is it just that the first virus does something to the cell to make it refractory to infection? It doesn't have to do anything about replication or infection. And it turns out that's not true because you get plenty of YFP. So killing the first virus kills super infection exclusion. So then we turn to my next favorite drug, which is a translation inhibitor. I don't recommend taking it recreationally. Uh, cyclohexamide basically blocks all protein synthesis in the cell. Um, cells don't like it very much and people definitely don't. But it's very effective. And so what we did is we applied our first virus 
Uh, and then we applied the drug, in this case cyclohexamide, so that we would block protein translation. New proteins could not be synthesized in that two hour window during the implementation of superinfection exclusion. And then we applied our YFP virus and removed the drug so we could actually detect our fluorescent protein expression. And what we saw was is that we could alleviate and we could increase the number of YFP positive cells in that population. We then asked a different question about transcription. Or oh, sorry, that's not transcription, that's a different drug. This is a drug that targets the virus. It's called phosphonoacetic acid. It prevents the virus from replicating. If we add PAA, we don't get virus titer, but if we add that PAA to the two hour drug treatment, then we don't get any change to exclusion. We get that, we get that return to YFP exclusion. So at this point, we can conclude, oh, at this point we conclude that it's an active viral process that requires a new protein product to be made during that two hour window, but it's independent of the duplication of the viral genome. And so this really narrows it into very early events during infection. And so we've been chasing this a lot. I'm just gonna tell you one element of the story we've been looking at. And so in terms of the early events of infection, you have a virion that binds to the surface, it will enter the cell, the capsid will dock to that nuclear pore, it will inject its genome, and it will begin to transcribe and translate newly synthesized viral proteins. In the meantime, the cell is not just sitting there taking it it has defensive pathways. These defenses are detecting the presence of those virions and activating an antiviral <laughs> cascade. And two critical factors that we're gonna talk about that are involved in that cascade are these transcription factors, NF-kappa B and IRF3. And upon activation, when the virion triggers this cellular sensing pathway, NF-kappa B and IRF3 become phosphorylated and will translocate into the nucleus where they will then drive the transcription and translation of antiviral responses, which include a protein known as interferon. It's called a cytokine. Anybody heard of interferons before? All right, interferons, if you're going to ever study viruses, interferons are the only thing you ever care about, okay? Don't let them tell you anything else. None of this B cell antibody stuff. Interferons are where it's at. So interferons are the first defensive cascade. And what they do is they only signal, with the, they, they produce these newly synthesized cytokines and those cytokines are secreted from the cell. That interferon will then bind back onto the infected cell to drive more antiviral gene expression, but it will also signal to surrounding cells that there is a presence of infection to set up what's known as a fire break. So interferon itself is one of the most critical pathways. And so we of course said, well, we're looking at interferon, we're looking at something that's defending the cell against further infection. Is it related to the production of interferon beta? So first we looked at whether or not uh, viral infection induces interferon beta. And so in the left panel here, we're just looking at the results of some fluorescence detection. We're looking at the relative amount of interferon beta in, in populations of cells. So most cells have a little bit of interferon beta, but when you infect with HSV, we have two different strains here, we get an increase in interferon beta expression. That beta is effective against the virus, so if we go into cells that lack interferon beta, these have been genetically engineered to, to remove that interferon beta gene, we get an increase in viral replication. So then we ask, okay, well now we have cells that lack interferon beta. If interferon beta is doing something, we should see a change to superinfection exclusion. So we went back to that flow cytometry experiment, now we're just looking at the YFP expression from that second inoculum. And you can see between wild type cells and interferon beta null cells, we get lots of YFP at T minus one, but if we wait that two hour period with exclusion, we actually get a faster exclusion. We get, we move from 20% of the population expressing YFP to 10. In fact, it's a little bit more dramatic than that. We really can't detect YFP positive cells in that population. So the interferon beta, the lack of interferon beta, actually allows SIE to be implemented faster. So it's not, so, so SIE is potentially separate from the activation of interferon responses. But we decided, okay, well let's move up the chain. To get interferon beta, you need to get uh, translocation and activation of NF-kappa B and IRF3. So when is NF-kappa B and IRF3 activated? So in this case, we looked at a Western blot, just ignore the left panel, uh, we biochemically uh, extracted the cells and looked at the nuclear fraction of these molecules of NF-kappa B and IRF3 during PRV and HSV infection. And for PRV, we saw that at two hours, we saw the uh, maximal increase in NF-kappa B in the nucleus, and that corresponds with a uh, slightly delayed but increasing amount of IRF3. With HSV, it's slightly faster at T0, so after the removal of that inoculum, we are seeing a lot of nuclear uh, NF-kappa B and IRF3 compared to that mock cell. 
Now this is where Luke comes in and I get to embarrass him because, oh, but I forgot to rig his movie to automatically play. So you'll just have to watch this once. I know, hold on. I cannot tell you how much pain this is. Hold on. Where's my cursor? There it is. Do you guys see my cursor? There we go. All right, so now we can look at that and, and see that translocation. So this is a P65 fusion. This is part of the NF-kappa B complex. It starts in the cytoplasm, and during the course of infection, uh, that will translocate into the nucleus, indicating activation of that NF-kappa B complex. Luke was only in the lab for 10 weeks, but he was able to get a number of these movies successfully done. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to capitalize it that much farther, but it's definitely correlated with what we were seeing biochemically, that most cells are responding and activating the NF-kappa B pathway during the course of infection. Oh, there we go. Okay, so now how do we modify that? So we again, as I said, drugs are the solution to life's problems. And so we went to a couple of different drugs, in this case, two drugs that would interfere with those transcription factors, JSH23 and BX795. JSH23 prevent or reduces the amount of NF-kappa B activation during infection. Same is true for BX795. Uh, we found that maximally 10 micromolar, but cells die at that amount. So for most of our experiments, we use it at between one and five micromolar. Um, and we can see that overall reduction in that uh, activation. So then if we apply JSH23 or BX795 to our exclusion assay, we can see it doesn't interfere with primary replication, but it does differentially interfere with the exclusion of that YFP. So the JSH23 actually allows more YFP to be expressed in that population, whereas BX795 speeds it up. We move from 37% to 25% versus uh, this suppressor, JSH23, which goes from 37 to 68, which is completely backwards, right? These are supposed to be antiviral molecules, but in this case, it looks like JSH23 is slowing down the course of the virus, preventing that in induction of SIE, whereas BX795 is, is concordant with our hypothesis that IR3 is working in an antiviral state and therefore allowing the virus to work faster. We haven't quite figured out what's going on with that yet, but at this point, we can conclude that HSV and PRV exclude those secondary infections early at two hours, and then it's independent of that glycoprotein D expression. It requires new viral protein production. It's an active process of virus. We also now know that the cellular antiviral responses are having a mixed effect, that some of these antiviral responses are actually working for the virus. Some of them are working against the virus. But we don't have a definitive answer yet on the mechanism that's implementing SIE, and that really bothers me. But that's okay, we can do other things. So in terms of thinking about how SIE works in neuronal spread, our general model is that those virions move down that axon and they'll spread out one at a time from that axon into those epithelial cells. Upon that initial spread event, the virus will set up shop and at two hours after setting up shop, it will now become exclusionary to any subsequent spreading virus out of those axons. And that superinfection exclusion is actually acting as a barrier to prevent infection. But the big question is, why would the virus do this? What is one of the consequences of co-infection? And so in terms of the consequences of co-infection, one of the biggest things with herpes viruses is when two herpes viruses enter the same cell, they begin to exchange information in a process known as recombination, where now the viruses will swap uh, elements of the DNA between each other during the replication process and come up with new viruses, chimeric viruses. The problem is, is that while this has been a well-known and well-studied process, we lack the, the molecular tools to really go after it without modifying the spread of and replication of the virus. So in another undergrad in my lab, this paper we published last, uh, about a year ago, can't believe it's already been a year, um, we looked at those fluorescent protein expressing herpes viruses. But now instead of having them in the same place, we put them at different sites in the viral genome. So we have a yellow virus, which is in this left arm here, and a blue virus, which is in the right arm there. And those viruses look like this. Hopefully you can see that this is a nice yellow plaque and this is a nice blue plaque. Now when those two viruses come together, they swap spit and you come up with these recombinant viruses. And that one way that it can recombine will produce a virus that lacks all FPs, a so-called dark virus. The other virus expresses both fluorescent proteins. It's a dual FP positive virus. Now my hope had been that this would happen at a reasonable rate but as most hopes and dreams in science, it was crushed quickly. Um, oops, that's not the slide I want. What we found is that very quickly after co-infection, 
the population would produce huge numbers of recombinant viruses. What you see here is that passagero, so this is after initial co-infection between the YFP and the RFP. So all the viruses that went in were either yellow or blue. What came out, 15% of that population that came out was dark, and 15% of the population came out was dual positive. So basically 30% of our total viral progeny after one round of co-infection was recombinant. That's a huge rate of genetic exchange between these viruses. What we saw then is we took that virus and we passaged it serially just taking the virus that was produced in one and throwing it into the next. And we found that the YFP, the CFP, and that dual FP virus were fairly stable. That it wasn't changing, it wasn't increasing or decreasing. The rate of recombination was so high that you couldn't see the additive effect of further rounds of amplification. The only time you saw anything was that, that silly uh, no FP expressing recombinant was slightly more fit than its uh, brethren and stole just about an equal amount from each ca category so we couldn't see that loss but would result in an overall slight net gain. Now, one might say that this is very depressing but I was actually very ex excited about this because it meant that we could get a very stable population of viruses during spread. And so we could now take it into very complicated models. I'll just show you the most complicated which was that I model again. I told you to remember this. Right? So we're now injecting those two viruses into the eye where we're going to get our primary sites of recombination. That recombinant population is then going to spread either retrograde or enterograde through that brain at those different sites of infection. We then can harvest those sites, separate them out, it's easier than you think, to dissect a mouse brain, crunch it up, and look at the population of viral progeny in either the eye, the left side, the ipsilateral side of the brain, the contralateral side of the brain, or the hind brain. What you're seeing here in these dot plots is individual mice uh, in those different regions uh, looking at either the parental or the recombinant. We did two different mouse strains. I'm just going to focus on the BALB-C strain. This is a more permissive strain of, of mice that allows higher rates of replication and spread of herpes viruses. What I hope you can see is that in the leftmost panel in that eye, we get about uh, about 75, 80% of the population is parental, and about 20% is recombinant. As we move deeper into the brain, so we move to, along that retrograde route to the ipsilateral side, we get a pretty close equivalency. So the parental and the recombinants are very close to the eye. We move to that contralateral side, to that uh, enterograde route. Sorry, I got that backwards. Contralateral is closer to the parental. The ipsilateral is the one that's a little bit higher. And then when we move to the hindbrain, which is also a terminal retrograde site, we actually get the highest amount of, of recombinant and the lowest amount of parental. So it looks like, and this is if you squint your eyes and shake your head, the rate of co-infection at these different sites is actually driving the diversity of the population. As you move retrograde, you get more and more co-infection and more and more recombinant production. And as you move in terograde, you actually are more faithful to that primary site of replication. The bottom panels are very complex distributions. We're looking at the average distribution in each population. This is really to tell you these are very strange populations of viruses. We can't predict uh, that the eye is going to produce uh, necessarily, in this case, mostly blue, which we saw in something like mouse 2, but in contrast, mouse 2, uh, for that contralateral side, that interrograde site, we were also getting mostly blue. So, yeah. But in the ipsilateral site, we had a very diverse population compared to what was present in the eye. And the same is true in the hindbrain. So basically, these populations are changing. And these populations are changing in respect to the exchange of genetic information. And so what I hope you can take away from that is that recombination is driving herpes virus diversification but recombination can only happen when you have high rates of co-infection at those sites in the brain. And so with that, I was going to just close real quick just to remind you about interrogate or neuronal spread in the system. We have our neurons, and the viruses can spread in two different ways. It can spread in that interrogate fashion, which involves a limited number of virions. So that cold sore that's working up in finals week here soon, you can blame just an individual viral particle for initiating that infection. Whereas if you show up in the hospital and they tell you you have herpes on the brain, you can know that that's because of greater amounts of co-infection and you should really be worried because now that's going to be driving a lot of diversification. And some of the big questions that are related to this is in terms of that 
backward spread to the CNS. Is this why it's very infrequent? Is this something that's controlled and regulated and that the virus doesn't like that or the host doesn't like that and doesn't want a lot of, of um, co-infection that occurs because that co-infection can lead to more CNS spread? In contrast, also, how does intracellular transport regulate that transmission event? We know a lot about enterograde spread. We don't know very much about dendritic spread. On the enterograde side, we still don't know the mechanisms that restrict this and is whether or not that restriction is beneficial. If we can figure out superinfection exclusion, we can alleviate exclusion, and maybe then we can do something to inhibit the virus. Maybe too many viral particles will actually activate these innate immune systems, and those innate immune responses will be more effective at regulating and, and, and limiting that cold sore from forming. And then also, how does this restriction influence interhost transmission? When you have uh, uh, mucosal membrane contact, that population of viruses started off as relatively pure monoculture. So is that what's transmitting? Is it only transmitting the best viruses after spread? Now, I wouldn't be here without the people who did the work. Uh, this is a little bit older picture of the lab. Uh, right now, we're a little small, so Arena is my senior technician. She does a lot of the neuronal work now um, and, and was a primary driver on the NF-kappa-B IR3 project. Kyle Hain is a technician who's been doing a lot with uh, inhibitors. He's actually looking at the opposite side, see if we can stimulate those uh, pathways to inhibit spread and co-infection. James is a graduate student in the lab, uh, not pictured as my other graduate student who just joined, Gary Dunn. Uh, James is working on some of the mechanism issues with uh, um, uh, superinfection exclusion. Hagen and Jonathan are two undergraduates who do great work. Uh, also pictured here is Gabby Law, who ran the recombination project, and Alex Hare, who did all the in vitro study, or in vivo studies. Anne-Marie Criddle isn't pictured here. Uh, she did a lot of the early characterization of superinfection exclusion. And of course, Luke, uh, who did a lot of these NF-kappa-B movies this last summer. I wouldn't also do this work without uh, support from the NIH. I have an R21. I've also got a career, had a career development award. I've also been supported through uh, MSU, through the COBRE uh, pro project, as well as the Montana Ag Experiment Station. I know that was a lot of info, so I want to say before I open this up to questions is no question is too basic to answer. Uh, if it even is, it's like, well, what kind of other herpes are there, right? So I'm throwing it out there. Uh, ask away. How do I turn on the lights? So we'll see the, those okay. okay, thank you. I'm not smart enough to work this podium. Oh, those switches. Yeah, Should, do, we want, do you want to watch Bob movie one more time? No, maybe. I could watch. I've watched Bob movie all day. <laughs> Literally, Bob was one of those movies. I was. Ca I, I just captured all the data. I was looking at it uh, the next morning, and I'm having my coffee, and I watched this movie, and I knew I was going to be presenting this movie for the rest of my life because it's the best movie I've ever made in my life. It's it's one of those rare times in science where you just can already predict the future. So, yes. So looking at a couple slides back, you were talking about how some specimens had like various susceptibility to infection. Is it possible they were carrying like antibodies in the house that allowed them to be less susceptible? Uh, so you're talking about the, the black six versus balopsy mice? Yeah. So it's not antibody mediated. Um, as far as we know, there is no mouse alpha herpes virus. So we don't, we've never seen any predisposing uh, serum-based immune mechanism. The current thinking with the difference in susceptibility, these are really inbred strains, and part of it is how they respond to infection. Black six mice tend to produce a lot more interferon and have a more robust innate response, uh, just in general, to all pathogens than, than the balpsy. So they just tend to be more susceptible. Um, and it's just part of that in, you know, massive inbreeding strain has made these weirdo mice. So, but nobody's definitively said it's exactly this mechanism. Yeah. Yes? So if recombination drives the virus to change in every, oh, every time the recombination does occur, why is it that we only see like one or two types of herpes in the population? That's a great question. So. Um, it's true and it's not true. So there's two major groups of herpes simplex viruses. There's herpes simplex type one and herpes simplex type two. These are genetically di very different viruses. 
they do recombine. We actually have clinical specimens where HSV1 and HSV2 have entered the same cell and have created a weird hybrid virus. Not only that though, but herpes viruses tend to be very geographically localized. So there are North American isolates which are more similar to each other than the European isolates and the Asian isolates. Weirdly, when you look at a sequence level, it looks like you can track massive amounts of genetic exchange between these isolates. And so you can say, okay, well, this, this, this European isolate has these elements from the Americas and these elements from Asia. So it looks like there has been, and there always has been a lot of diversity driving that. It's just that we can't, it doesn't, it isn't like the classical like flu where we can now track it as its means of, of evading the immune response. We don't really know what this diversity means, um, but it's something that's been really massively underappreciated by the field. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No question too small. How did I get my dashing good looks? No. <laughs> um, I know, well, it's self-serving. But you throw out a joke and you see if somebody else comes up with something. I can only talk, I've talked for an hour. It's your guys' turn, yes. Uh, how does super infectious solution That's a good question. Um, so we've never tested that. Uh, the two viruses that we use should be equivalent, so they should maintain the same capacity for superinfection exclusion, but that's just an assumption. It's something that we should consider testing. The thing is, is that all those recombinants I showed you, they had two fluorophores, but recombination itself is a messy event. It tends to make more mutations that we can't see wherever that site of genetic transfer occurs tends to be error prone. And so you can get point mutations or small insertions, duplications or deletions in the viral genome. And so we actually have seen in many of our recombinant progeny that they have had reduced capacities to replicate just because of the nature of how they were generated. Yes. Um, how do you use, um, can you talk a little, do you know how it well, works? Right. Do you talk about the mechanisms of the so, so, so unfortunately, for, there is no vaccine for herpes simplex virus. Um, there has been 30 years of study to do this and nobody's been able to generate protective immunity. So uh, for those that aren't in the know, vaccines are preparations that provide an immune response that should protect you from infection or disease. Now, everybody in this room has been vaccinated against a herpes virus. Hopefully everybody in the room has been. Uh, Chickenpox, varicella zoster virus. Varicella zoster is a, one of the childhood vaccines uh, that's, that's been produced. Uh, originally, it was an attenuated virus. The virus was subjected to mutation so that it didn't replicate as well. But it would still produce a protective immune response. So rather than having to get the natural infection with chickenpox, I don't think anybody in this room is old enough to have been at a chicken pox party, have you? Anybody had a chicken pox party when you were growing up? Were you, you, geez, man, you're old school. All right, so it used to be before the vaccine, one kid in the neighborhood would get infected, and then all of a sudden you were having a sleepover at their house, and then you'd get chicken pox. That was how we used to protect ourselves. But now we have a shot, and you get the shot in the arm, and you were basically purposely exposed. It generated protective adaptive immunity that prevented you from getting infected. Now, we've actually, they've rolled out about three years ago, a new chickenpox vaccine, which is based on subunits. They've purified elements of the chickenpox. The immune response is targeting those units to protect you from that course of infection. The problem is we don't know if it prevents infection, it just prevents disease. And the biggest problem with the old vaccine was you were actually infected with a chickenpox virus. So even though you were vaccinated, you still had chickenpox hanging out in your dorsal root ganglia just as if you had the natural disease. We've seen in the clinic, people who were vaccinated, they were super infected with another chickenpox virus. Those viruses entered the same neurons, they recombined, and then when they were suffering, they, were, they, they presented to the hospital because they, they had a severe reactivation event. If you're not familiar with chickenpox reactivation, this is shingles, it hurts, it sucks, don't get it. Um, but this guy was in the hospital and they swabbed his shingles uh, lesions and they found that it was a recombinant between a circulating chickenpox and the vaccine strain itself. 
So this is really weird. And this is probably the hardest part about developing vaccines to herpes viruses is you may be protected from the disease, but it doesn't mean you can't be super infected. And the big talk of the field this year is for another herpes virus, cytomegalovirus. It seems like people are constantly exposed to cytomegalovirus, but nobody ever knows it because it doesn't cause anything more than maybe a mild fever. Most people are infected with no apparent disease. It's only a problem if you become immunocompromised or you have an organ transplant. But in this case, your, your multiple frequent infections with cytomegalovirus is driving the diversity of that virus in the human population. Is that sort of getting at some of the elements of your question? Okay. Yes? So say that were to occur where you would have like a vaccine that recombines with uh, like a wild type virus, could that potentially create a new virus that is like resistant to vaccines? Well, that's, that's the, I'd like to say it's a million dollar question if I ever get a million dollars from the NIH. Um, but this is, this is actually happening. So in China, they vaccinated against pseudorabies virus. And they now have vaccine evasion variants, which appear to be exactly that. Recom recombination between the vaccine strain and a wild type strain to create a new virus, which is able to overcome the pre-existing immunity to the vaccine strain and has enhanced lethality. So that's the other reason I like studying pseudorabies is that I can scare people with, stuff, with statements like that, right? It's all about making people afraid. Nobody's afraid of herpes. Herpes is a punchline. Right? But if I tell you you're going to die of a neuroinvasive infection, there we go. Now we're getting somewhere. Maybe. Any other questions? Well, if not, oh, sorry, yes. Then uh, can cold sores be like hereditary, like follow the generation? I mean, because certain people get them and it's like almost continuous, you know, not. Yeah, factors like stress or whatever, but like... Right. So, so there's a combination of factors there. Part of it is your genetics. Some people seem to be more predisposed to frequent reactivation. And we've, there, are, um, there are genetic alleles that seem to predispose people not only to herpes infection, but more invasive or more frequent herpes infection. Part of it is also the strain that you're infected with. And um, most people tend to get herpes from their parents. Um, because, you know, not in any nefarious way, it's just you're in close contact with these humans for a very long time, and that tends to be where you get your herpes simplex viruses from. And so there's a couple of family studies that actually have tracked the genetics of uh, herpes viruses in three generations, and it does seem that it passes from the parents to the child. But that, that's sort of a case-specific study. These were people that had a very severe primary infection. They'd have what's known as uh, herpes, herpetic uh, gingivostomatitis. Basically, their gums would become massively inflamed with this massive herpes infection, and they'd present in the hospital. Um, so that's one of the reasons why they picked up. So in that case, it's sort of the genetics made them clinically relevant and studied. Um, so yeah, so it's factors of, the, of, of your heredity as well as the virus you get infected with. Yes? Sorry. In regard to herpes simplex infections, well, my mother did have chicken pox. That's, I think it's not to my knowledge, but anyhow, I didn't know herpes simplex. First, I had one right under here. That's long gone, by some decades. Now I chronically have one on my lower lip. Is it the same one or two different? That's an interesting question. So, so the interesting thing about herpes on the face is that it's infecting the trigeminal ganglia, which is your primary site of innervation for those regions. Now, you do see drift over time. People will frequently reactivate, but then we'll see tapering off. Uh, you'll see migration. It'll start here and sort of move there. I, I don't know about it moving from up that far up to that far down. It should still be in the same region of the trigeminal, so it could have just migrated slowly. Um, there's also the process of re-inoculation. Every time you have a cold sore, you're shedding live virus. Um, so if you touch your face, you scratch that spot, and then you touch somewhere else, it can just be physically transmitted that way. It's actually one of the primary concerns when you have chickenpox reactivation, uh, especially on a facial region. If you get it in your eye, 
you just don't want herpes in your eye. So, so ocular herpes is terrible, and that, so that can be true for simplex as well as, so you can, re, you can just physically transmit it from there to there. Um, the best way to find out, though, is, is to be able to, to sequence both isolates. Um, but that tends to be a little harder. Most people don't, don't isolate. <laughs> so, yes? How is it possible to be a carrier of a virus, let's call it mononucleosis, how is it possible to be a carrier and not display symptoms that maybe someone else does? Right. So uh, Epstein-Barr is a fun one. Uh, it's it's uh, gamma herpes virus that likes to hang out, or is it gamma? Yeah, it's gamma. Gamma herpes virus likes to hang out in the B cells. 90% of people that are infected don't even know they have it. And once you have it, you shed fairly frequently for the rest of your life in your saliva. And you have no overt disease. There's no problems with it. 10% of people who, who contract uh, EBV come down with flu-like symptoms of that 10%. It's something like another 10% come down with more severe infectious mononucleosis symptoms. I was one of them. I lost my freshman in 15. It was fantastic. My spleen in, uh, engorged, my liver engorged, my throat almost swelled shut. It was a lot of fun. Um, I shed that virus for the rest of my life. And in this case, so, so EBV, uh, CMV, uh, a couple of others of those weirdo herpes viruses, most people will shed it forever. They will never show any disease. It's only when something else happens. So EBV can transform uh, those B cells. And given a couple of other predisposing factors, especially if you're in a malaria region, you then are at enhanced risk for a B cell lymphoma known as Burkitt's lymphoma. Um, that is a virally transformed B cell that's causing a massive illness. But that doesn't happen in the first world. So. But this is how they are. This is, you know, in fact, herpes simplex is kind of weird because it causes disease, it causes that cold sore every time it reactivates. Most herpes viruses reactivate with no apparent um, overt illness or sign. So. Excellent. Well, please um, feel free to come on down and keep the conversation going. I know that uh, it's a Thursday before a mini spring break before the last week of school and it's sunny. Um, so some of you, I'm sure, are down to just be outside. But thank you, thank everybody for um, being here and you know, come on down, keep the conversation going.